Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Build a Syllabus and Introduction to Mastery Grading. My name is Kira Edwards and I'm the Director of uh, Programs and Grants Management at MAA. Today's webinar is presented by MAA and it's also funded by the Paul R. and Virginia P. Halmos Fund. Uh, today's webinar actually wraps up our series that we had this week on innovative course design for the fall. We wanted to make sure that we were preparing everyone, uh, those who are getting ready for the fall semester in a couple of weeks or a month, depending on when your semester may start. So uh, Tuesday we had a great webinar on online inquiry-based learning, and yesterday we had a, another great one on teaching upper-level mathematics online, both very interactive, great webinars. So if you weren't able to join, they will be available via um, recordings on MA Connect. Uh, this one will be um, recorded in, on MA Connect next week as well. So we have some wonderful presenters for y'all uh, today. So with that, thanks again for joining, and uh, Sharona, I'll pass it on to you. Great, thank you. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Sharona. I'll introduce myself a little bit more later, but just real quick, uh, as, um, uh, as was said, the MAA is recording this webinar and recording the right, retaining the right to show it again and to distribute it uh, by participating, you're agreeing that your contributions do become a part of the recording. And we wanna make sure that you know how you can interact with us. Many of you have figured out the chat. Uh, there are multiple ways to ask questions. If you have a bigger question that is specifically for one of the panelists, if you can drop that in the Q&A and that will an get answered either live or in writing. And in the chat, smaller ideas, questions, thoughts, feel free to respond. Um, and at the end, if we have time, we will do the raise hand on the participant panel in order to ask verbal questions. So hopefully we'll get time for that. A uh, couple other requests, please, in the chat, especially use appropriate netiquette. We're all here to learn and we're trying to be open to new ideas. So we're asking for a polite and professional in the chat. And also to make sure that you switch your chat to all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, we get very strange one-sided conversations with the panelists. And with that, that I'm going to hand it over to Kate. Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar. Um, so I'm gonna be introducing some of the basic ideas about mastery grading and then turn it over to Sharona. Sharona's background has to do a lot with online learning, so she's gonna tell us about that. Um, and at the end, we have four speakers who are gonna tell us about um, part of what they wrote in a paper called uh, the Build a Syllabus. And so they are really gonna share all of their insights about ways that you might be able to implement these ideas in your courses this fall or in years to come. Thanks, Sharona. Um, so like I said, I'm Kate Owens. I'm from the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about the classes I teach, we are a, a pretty small um, public liberal arts type college. We have about 11,000 mostly undergraduates with a couple um, master's degree programs and various things. So I teach a lot of our general education courses and throughout our curriculum is where I've been using mastery grading. So probably maybe about 2014, maybe about six years ago, I really got thinking about why we assign grades and what those messages are sending to students. I mean, there's so many answers here and thinking about these questions has really impacted the way that I approach my courses and what I'm teaching, the way that I write a syllabus, what kind of messages grades are sending to students, are those positive things, are they impacting students and their ability to learn in a positive way as we go forward? thinking about what grades might reflect some of the things that came up in thinking about this is you know things about like attendance do i want attendance to have a, a place in my grade scheme um, what about students behavior how about how much work they do what about the quality of that work um, should they really be forced to stick with their past shortcomings early in the semester or should students have the option to reflect and improve over time when we began planning for the mastery grading conference which happened last June, we sent out the questions about why we assign grades to several hundred. We had over 500 mostly math up for higher education faculty join us there. So the next thing I'll show you is a word cloud of some of the things that people wrote down. So why do we give people grades? What do grades tell students? These are some of the same kinds of things that you might be thinking about too. Stuff about understanding and feedback, what's required, motivation. So for my own classes, I started thinking about the way that I was doing grades, which was a really traditional format. So, you know, points-based, a weighted kind of percentage scheme. But there are some real big problems with traditional grades. 
So here are just some of them, and I'm sure that there are probably many more. So one big problem is that students in my courses often had trouble knowing how they were doing. I mean, even my math major students wouldn't be able to compute what their grade was or you know, how many points do I need on the final exam to get that B plus? We've all had that question in office hours before. Um, giving meaningful advice to my students could be really hard because I'd have a student who I know came, you know, and say, I got a 76 on this test, what can I do differently? And I wouldn't really know. I wouldn't know there are so many different ways that you could earn a 76 on a midterm. So giving like specific advice about what that student should focus on, where they could um, study more, how I could help them could be really hard. We just lose so much information about our students, and at least I did in my traditional grade book. I mean, there are plenty of students who would all have the same exact average of 84, but that 84% wouldn't reflect the same information about those students. Some students would do really strong in the beginning and then have a shortfall over other students would sort of get their momentum later on, and yet they'd all have that 84. Um, there's always a disjunction between the goals of my courses and what the individual scores were, I never was really sure, you know, does this person really understand calculus or those big ideas that I was aiming for in my classes? And is my gradebook really reflecting those course goals and those course ideas and what students have done? And lastly, traditional grades have the problem of, you know, relying to inequitable outcomes for students. You know, students really need to have different kinds of feedback, different opportunities to display knowledge. And some of those universal design ideas can be really well implemented with mastery grading. So thinking about all these things brought me to my philosophy about course grades and what I want them to have show. So my philosophy now is that grades should reflect demonstrated mastery of course content. So I've moved away from a lot of those behavior-based things like attendance or participation. Um, the other thing that's really important to me in my own framework is that grades have a positive effect on student learning. So I don't want to see how my grades be what's forced on the student right now. Grades are a dynamic thing that can change over time and as a student grows or learns more, I'm completely happy to update those grades based on that new information. There's never a bad time for more learning for a student to demonstrate to me that they've learned more of the ideas that are important. So with that said, that's what brought me to mastery grading. So I guess we should get to it. What is mastery grading? Now I'll say that probably every instructor that implements a mastery grading scheme does it a little bit differently. So here's a brief definition, and this was pulled from the MAA Primus, art of, um, Primus issue on mastery grading. This is kind of how we defined this. So first of all, instead of having your grade book reflect um, a list of activities or a list of events, a list of quizzes, um, instead your grade book is really about learning targets or objectives or standards. So, you know, this might be a little target like, you know, uh, a student can perform the quotient rule for derivatives or something like that. And my grade book reflects that. The second thing is that the grades themselves are based on mastery levels. So maybe something from no mastery shown to full mastery or some kind of proficiency. So, you know, a novice up to proficient, something like that. So I don't have any more grades that are seven out of 12 points in my grade book. Um, and then the third thing is that eventual mastery matters. So I have a column in my grade book for maybe the quotient rule and I'm open to new information for my students to demonstrate to me, you know, last week I really, I don't think I really got it. I really was messing it up, but I really studied over the weekend. Um, I know how to do it now. And I will take that information and update the grade book to reflect that. So they get more than one attempt at the kind of learning targets that we're looking at. Um, so I know that this is probably a lot of information all at once. And since we only have a little bit of time today, I just want to tell you about a great resource. So masterygrading.com. This was the website that was affiliated with the Mastery Grading Conference. All of the panelists today participated in that conference. It was last month. Um, the conference information is still up. So if you're looking for a good place to find a bunch of information that's available right now, the pre-conference assignment and the resources page there have everything from the basic definitions, like the one that I just showed on the previous slide, through there's a syllabus repository there. So if you want to see what this looks like, in a particular course, in a Euclidean geometry course, or in a contemporary math course, or enter to proofs course, there's a syllabus repository there that reflects mastery grading and those types of courses. We're looking for new submissions to that all the time. The other thing is our two-day conference lasted for what, maybe eight hours both of those days. We probably have at least 16 hours of webinar recordings that are up. So if you are super excited about this and want to spend the next 16 hours of your life watching us talk like this, please feel free. Um, and our contact information is all there too. So if you want to come back to that later and hit us up with any questions that you have, we would love to have you do that. So with that, I'll pass it back to Sharona. Thanks, Kate. 
So as we said, hi, I'm Sharona Krinsky. I'm an adjunct professor of mathematics at Cal State Los Angeles. And I um, uh, came to Mastery Grading because I read Kate's blog about it. So it's Kate's fault. And that was about four years ago. And since then, I have converted a Calc 1 class, a Calc 2 class, a Calc 3 class. And I'm sort of known for doing this at scale because I converted our entire introductory statistics program to mastery grading. Um, we usually have about 1,400 students who go that, through that program in the fall. And one of the things that, of course, we did in the big pivot is we had to pivot online. And I was responsible for, at that point, we had about 400 students across 12 sections of the course. And one of the issues with online, of course, as we all know, is that we are faced with the fact that they have access to books and notes and technology. They have access to other people. They have access to things like Chegg. And the question that we have had and what's always driven me um, even before the pivot is what are we grading? Are we grading mathematical knowledge or are we grading their ability of how to Google something or how to plug something in Chegg or, or how much friends do they have? Um, and what we found is in my course, we had a lot less of the uh, incentives to cheat and that we continue to incentivize learning. So again, like Kate said, my grade book uh, reflects our learning targets. So when we pivoted online, the students already knew that, the learning targets were already in the course shell, and they had already invested a lot in trying to succeed, and they knew that they were continuing to try to, um, try to do it, and they don't want to go and give up on themselves and, and go copy someone else's work when they've already put so much effort in, into trying to master it. And they're very proud of their work at that point. You know, they've shown um, what they can do and they don't want to devalue that. Additionally, no single assessment is high stakes because there are these opportunities to repeat until the very end, they can just try it again. Um, and there's also flexible ways of demonstrating mastery. A lot of our stuff, they really have to, you know, I'm looking for evidence of do you understand this? So that's what they have to show me. And they were able to do it. Also, it's very interesting, but transparent, detailed learning objectives are usually not aligned with the answers that they're going to get from other sources. So other people who've taken other classes or go on Chegg, it becomes very clear that those answers don't match the types of things we're looking for because we're looking for very clear, very detailed learning targets. So we actually had a lot less problems switching online because of the clarity and the structure that we had. So in spring 2020, we had over 400 students taking intro stats, and we had four identified instances of cheating on Chegg. And then a recent blog post by Robert Talbert, I thought summed it up better than I could ever. If you can revise and resubmit just about any significant piece of work multiple times and get helpful feedback each time until you're happy with your grade, then the value proposition of cheating becomes empty. And I thought that's definitely my perspective. So then the question is, how do we do this? And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our build a syllabus folks. Hi everyone. So we'll do uh, just quick introductions. My name's Justin Dunmire. I'm from Frostburg State University. Uh, I'm Emily Shilly Turner I'm from the University of Laverne in Southern California. Tom Mahoney, Emporia State in Emporia, Kansas. And I'm Chad Wiley, and I'm also from Emporia State in Emporia, Kansas. So uh, a quick outline, as, as Kate mentioned, um, the, the presentation here is based on a paper that Emily, Tom, Chad, and I wrote uh, called the Mastery Grading Build a Syllabus Workshop. That's available on Primus as part of a special issue on mastery grading. And in that paper and in this presentation, we'll, we'll be addressing these four questions that you can see here and their sub-questions. Uh, the difference between the paper and our presentation is that in this presentation, we're gonna give kind of our answers to these questions, kind of how we're thinking about them right now. Uh, whereas in the paper, um, as, as I think Kate mentioned earlier, there's uh, Rachel Weir has a syllabus repository with tons of mastery grading syllabi for math classes. Uh, and that's available on the Mastery Grading website uh, resources page. And in our paper, we did a deep dive into that repository and sort of saw how did, how did that repository answer these questions. So we have more than 50 different syllabi uh, linked 
in, are referenced in that paper. Uh, so you can check that out too. Um, and then we're going to talk about some pitfalls that we've had along the way, because there have been many. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions from you. And um, we're particularly excited uh, to, to be talking about this as we are on the precipice of another semester that is already online or in danger of going online. And uh, our experience has been that um, the switch to online assessment was uh, quite painless uh, for uh, when, when it came to mastery grading. So Emily, do you want to take us away for, with our first question? Yeah, so the first question that we had um, in the paper and we're going to talk about here is about the learning objectives. And this one is, is arguably the most important one. Um, because when you answer this question for yourself and about your class, then it will help you kind of do all these other things you need to do, which is the syllabus and set up the grade book and things like that. Um, so really it's about thinking about what topics are critical in your class. Um, you really have to define this on your own. Um, the syllabus repository is awesome and it has a lot of examples. Um, but you need to kind of personalize this um, because what is critical for you may be different than for someone else. Um, so these, could, these kind of objectives could include things um, that are content-based, of course. Um, so, you know, they could include things like skills or um, things related to the course. They could also include things um, about processes um, or things that are a bit more general um, about, you know, students must understand this. Um, or even, um, I know, I think Sharona uses some sort of like mathematical practice standards. So they can even go beyond and say, you know, I, I would like you to be able to, you know, understand if your solution is a reasonable solution or things like that. Um, so again, depending on, you know, what is important to you and what's critical to your class, you might have different types of objectives. So they could be skill-based broad or process based, um, and maybe there's other requirements like projects or portfolios that you want students to do as well. Um, so one good place to start here is just to look at maybe final exams from previous semesters, um, looking at what are some things that you have tested students on before. Um, those may or, or may not overlap with some of your critical objectives. Um, and then from that, you can sort of build these out. So um, I think we'll, we'll start to talk about how we've answered this question for ourselves. Um, so I think, Tom, are you next? So when I, Chad and I frequently get together before each semester and brainstorm how to design our courses to incorporate mastery grading. Over the years, that has led us to basically converge on the same syllabi for a particular course. So to save you from hearing the same things twice, we'll each talk about a different kind of course. So just know that the ideas that I talk about are things that Chad has also done and vice versa. The question I'm gonna be looking at will be, you know, how do I do this for skill-based courses? I'm thinking calculus, college algebra. I choose mastery grading for these courses because I want students to demonstrate that they have mastered a particular subject area because these skills are required in future courses. Chad will be answering these questions from the perspective of how we approach our proof-based courses, such as abstract algebra, real analysis, or an intro to proof writing course. Some courses we teach like linear algebra involve a blend of ideas from both skill-based and proof-based courses. But answering this first question about choosing learning objectives for skill-based courses, I define my objectives based on what I cover from each section of the textbook. Usually I end up with about one objective per section, which for a five credit Calc 1 or Calc 2 course is about 25 objectives. When I was starting out with mastery grading, this setup made the transition a lot easier because I, it was conceptually similar to the kinds of objectives that I would have measured in the traditionally graded course, and all I had to change was how I was choosing to assess the things that I would have assessed anyway. Some of the objectives that I use for calculus in college algebra include like, finding limit expressions using L'Hopital's rule, or applying the fundamental theorem of calculus, or doing shifts on functions. And sometimes I might have a single objective that combines multiple things. So in this last example that I can express uh, linear equations in point slope form, slope intercept form, equation of a line from two points, I group all those together and I'll give them like a single assessment that says, do you know this category of things? And now I'll pass it on to Chad for his thoughts. 
All right, so like Tom said, we do similar things. So I'm gonna be focusing on upper division courses that tend to be more proof-based, like you know, like I said, abstract algebra or, or topology or things like that. Um, in these courses, I, I generally don't think that very specific content objectives fit as well as they do in say a calculus course. So I end up using a more of a specifications grading system instead. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about the the specific differences between specs-based grading and standards-based grading. For our purposes, um, the objectives in a more specifications graded course are less focused on meeting certain learning targets, like you know using using the quotient rule, and more on engaging in good mathematical practices. Uh, so my content objectives tend to be pretty broad. Things like you know identify topologies and topological spaces, and I consider good writing to be an objective as well. Uh, now, many of my proof courses are online just because of how Emporia State organizes its graduate program. Um, and so in addition, I will also typically have a sort of unofficial objective that's focused on building a class community because I think that's something important in an online setting. So for example, I'll have students participate in uh, discussion threads to build connections with other students. And these have the added bonus that I can have, uh, I can encourage students to think more broadly about course concepts by choosing appropriate discussion prompts and also by having students sort of contribute their own, uh, their own topics. So next, Justin is gonna talk about how he chooses objectives. Uh, so uh, I tend towards broad objectives. Um, so uh, for instance, I have here the, the 12 standards uh, that cover my entire calculus course. Uh, and as, as I mentioned in chat, they're all, they're all phrased as I can statements. So I can interpret the derivative as a rate of change. I can interpret the integral as accumulation or net change. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for, for skill type courses like calculus, you can see at the bottom I have calculation. So I can calculate derivatives with at least 75% accuracy. So that's a way uh, I get around having uh, separate standards for the quotient rule for the product rule. Um, because sometimes I had, a, a, if, a, if a derivative question involved multiple rules, I had a hard time knowing which one they messed up whenever there was a mistake, right? Am I grading this on the product rule, but it's chain rule. So I group them all together now. And that's one of the things that uh, you have to think about how does that change in remote instruction. Uh, and the MAA did an excellent webinar on online assessment um, that, really, that really supports mastery grading very well. Um, and so I, I also have requirements in my courses about communication, attention to details, but these rarely appear as separate objectives and instead factor into my grading scheme, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and there was a question in the Q&A about standards versus specifications-based grading. And so uh, the way I see it is in a standards-based grading class, I have these standards, and these are the ones that you're being tested against. Um, for my intro to proofs class, I use a specifications approach where I say, this is what a good proof looks like. And your grade is based on how many high quality proofs do you produce? I'm not testing individual standards like I know I can make a proof about induction, I can make a proof about this. I assume that that stuff's going to come out anyway. Um, instead, the grade is based on how many high quality proofs you produce. And that's what's, that's kind of what I see as a specifications grading uh, approach. So Emily, do you want to talk about your approach next? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I kind of overlap with a lot of stuff that people have already talked about. Um, but yeah, someone did ask about standards and topics. Um, those can be different. Um, so, you know, depending on the course, my standards may cover, you know, multiple sections of a textbook. Um, sometimes I don't have a textbook, so that, you know, wouldn't apply. Um, but they're, they're often topic based. Um, so, you know, I can take a derivative using the product rule and quotient rule or something like that. Um, I have a, an example here. This is from a proofwriting course. Um, and also I'll say um, that a lot of these are kind of adapted from uh, what Rachel Weir did, so um, shout out to her. Um, but so, you know, for the proof writing, proof 
based courses, I do concept checks. So these are more just applying definitions um, and then also proof writing standards. So breaking up those into two different things. Um, and then beyond that, there's other things that I've incorporated um, that are that are standards basically. So, you know, passing certain projects, um, participating in the learning community, which I stole that language from Justin. Um, and then also maybe doing some sort of portfolio or application type problems is another component um, that students would have to do to receive, you know, whichever grade they're going for. Um, so, Tom? There we go, I'm unmuted. Once you decide what objectives you want students to master, you have to decide what you mean by the word mastery, as well as how you plan to measure that mastery. This includes decisions about whether to use quizzes or exams or projects or homework to assess mastery. Maybe you just want a binary pass revised system, or maybe you want a more refined system with multiple levels of mastery. Is demonstrating mastery of an objective something that students only need to do once, or should students demonstrate repeated mastery to show some kind of retention? Of course, it's not enough to just measure mastery. It's absolutely vital that students know where they stand in the course. So you need to think about how you will communicate students' progress towards mastering those objectives and getting an eventual letter grade. Chad? I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> okay. So uh, for my upper division courses, uh, I measure mastery of both the, the content knowledge and the writing skill by looking at student homework proofs. Uh, I feel like this matches what we do professionally, which is primarily you know, writing proofs. Uh, and so I think it needs to be the primary focus of the course. Um, this bit is a little more controversial, but I, I generally don't give exams because I don't feel like they match up with professional mathematical practice. Um, if you grade students on writing proofs fast, they tend to think that writing proofs fast is the point, and I don't feel like for me that it is. So, um, so I, I ditch that, but I do often require a presentation or a portfolio of some kind to demonstrate, uh, you know, deeper overall understanding. Um, so the proofs are graded as either pass or revise, uh, just a binary scale. Uh, a passing proof needs to be logically correct and it needs to be clearly written. Those are the, the two big, um, big pillars that I, that I use. Uh, I usually tell students that they need to be supplying the details of the argument and not making the reader do it for them. Um, generally, if, if I'm reading it and I feel like I have to put too much work in, then that's a cause for revision. Um, perfection isn't necessary, but I try to set the bar reasonably high. Um, and I do that partly out of practicality. We'll talk a little bit later about, you know, the, the balance between giving students freedom and, and organizing your workload. But um, I'm also going for a model of knowing a few things really well, as opposed to knowing a lot of, a lot of different things. Uh, something you might see more in like a calculus course, for instance. Um, so having a high bar for writing quality, you know, encourages good writing habits, which I think is important. Um, revisions are really important in making the system work uh, because, as Kate said before, we're, we're measuring eventual mastery. Um, and this is something that is, again, more like professional mathematics. This is an idea that I got from Robert Talbert at Grand Valley State. Um, if you think about what happens when you submit an article to a journal, it, there's, a, there's typically like a back and forth revision process. Um, and so if that's the way that we actually do math, then why shouldn't we teach students using the same kind of framework? Um, so all of the proofs that I grade can be revised as necessary with some limitations to make sure that the workload isn't too much. Um, in terms of communicating grades to students, uh, Canvas, that's the LMS that we use, uh, it really loves percentages, like it's really built around a traditional weighted average system. So my gradebook isn't the best. Um, it's enough to show students how many problems they've passed. I've rigged it up so that it, it will do that at least. Um, but its main job is to give me a place to do this back and forth with them so that they, I can get them improving and getting them up to the, the bar that I want for their writing. Okay, let's see how Justin defines mastery in his classes. 
Yeah, so uh, in each of my classes, it really depends. So uh, I do almost all of my mastery testing or mastery assessment on in-class quizzes. Um, and there's a number of in-class quizzes for each learning objective. That depends heavily on the class and the objective. So in calculus, I can interpret the derivative. That might appear on seven different assessments throughout the semester because we hit it over and over and over again. Uh, in differential equations, on the other hand, each, uh, each objective appears on exactly two in-class quizzes. Uh, and now uh, in-class might not be the right word anymore. Um, after the spring, <laughs> moving everything online, uh, I gave the same kinds of quizzes as take-home and it worked really well. So even if we're face-to-face -face in the fall, uh, I still plan on using uh, the kind of take-home style. Um, so the, the assessments themselves, uh, I'll set aside the final exam for a moment. The, these quizzes are graded on a three-tier system. Uh, those tiers are not yet, pass, and pass plus. So each of my in-class quizzes has two questions. Generally speaking, they have a basic question and a reach question. And to, to get the pass, you just have to answer the basic question or overall communicate that you show me that you understand what this topic is about. I'm not so concerned that you dropped a minus sign here if that doesn't communicate that you don't know how to use the quotient rule, just to keep using that example. Um, on the other hand, to get the pass plus, the higher grade, you have to get the basic question and the reach question correct, and your work has to attend to detail, so you can't have too many of those dropped minus signs. It has to be clearly communicated. Um, so that's a, that's the higher bar, but really I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the question holistically Have you communicated that you understand the concept if so? Yes um, Then you get the pass uh, And my experience has been that I, I do have a, a High value of the first time a student sees the question. So I tend to not do a lot of reassessment We'll talk about that in a little bit um, final exams uh, I treat the final exam as a grade modifier so based on their in-class quizzes, the students have a pre-final grade, A through F, and scores higher than 90% on the final grade move you up one letter. Otherwise, the final might move you down one letter if you're below a certain threshold. Um, and so I found that as a nice way to have the students have a, like a Hail Mary kind of thing at the end where they're like, oh, you know, I, I'm at a B right now, but if I just get that 90%, I'll go up. But students who are sitting at an A can relax a little bit. They still have to study a little bit for the final, but the pressure is not on uh, on that final to keep that grade so much. Um, for me to consider an object to be mastered, uh, it requires one or more passes, as I've noted here. Um, and then the other the other bit is about communication. Communication is so important. Um, it's really good to have just anything you can do in, in your LMS to make sure that the grade's clearly communicated. Um, but failing that uh, in a normal semester, maybe having printouts or do-it-yourself grade trackers um, that they can fill out and, and keep tabs on is very helpful. Emily, do you wanna talk about your approach next? Yeah. Um, so, oh, I'm on the wrong slide somehow. No, I think you're back. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so I do usually kind of one standard first versus one quiz. Um, and I often have been doing quiz sessions. So you can take multiple quizzes. Uh, this sometimes turns into um, more of a self-paced thing for students. So I have students in different, um, taking different quizzes at the same time. Um, this has worked nicely in the online environment because I, um, often will do online quizzes in some way, sometimes through a platform like my math lab and sometimes just putting things in Google Drive or emailing, emailing things to students. Um, but, you know, it allows students to kind of take the standards that they're ready for and that they have, have been preparing. Um, and the proof-based courses, you know, mastery is often by passing a proof that's often, you know, revolves around getting the, the logic correct, but also some sort of formatting things or presenting it in a nice manner. Um, and then also sometimes um, for proofs, they have to pass them like on a homework. So that would be something written and they can use their notes and things like that. And then also on a quiz. Um, yeah, so the final that I give depends on the course. I have 
stolen Justin's idea for some courses, um, which is the kind of grade modifier final um, that he mentioned. So, you know, that would be like a points-based thing. That's often nice if you have to give a final um, or if you have some sort of class that is coordinated in some way, um, you can kind of use that um, as just a grade modifier for students. Um, sometimes I don't give a final at all. Um, I do just kind of using that week for revisions, retaking quizzes, things like that. Um, and I actually use Blackboard to keep track of grades. Um, Blackboard has many, many flaws, but one thing that I do like about it is that you can input grades as text. So I can, you know, make my, my column that says standard one or whatever, and then put in there pass or revise. Um, so that makes it nice to, to keep track of grades. Students can see the grades um, in Blackboard as well, um, and that has been pretty easy. Um, I also often just do grade updates every couple of weeks. I think really that's more to establish norms, that students should be able to calculate their own grade, that students you know, need to maybe get used to this new sort of grading system for them. So um, I will help them through that by just sending great updates. Tom? I almost exclusively use binary pass reattempt systems. So primarily with, with uh, quizzes covering a single objective. A pass is reserved for work that is perfect, except for maybe an error that is trivial or insignificant. But for such a restrictive uh, system, there can feel like a lot of edge cases, especially when you're trying to determine exactly which errors are significant and which ones are insignificant. And what has been really helpful to me is for any non-obvious case, I just ask myself, will the student benefit from trying this again? Will the student benefit from trying this again? Student learning is, after all, the end goal. So this question helps me to focus on specifically that goal. Students may end up with two passes on each objective and exams are an opportunity to earn a pass on each standard that has been covered. And on the next slide, I will show you that I keep track of progress using pivot tables. I haven't been happy with trying to get this to work in any of the LMS systems. Uh, and so pivot tables have been superior to everything else that I've tried. The learning curve can be a bit steep, but the idea is that you use a spreadsheet to keep a ledger of every single event. For example, Chad Wiley took a quiz on June 2nd in office hours over derivatives and earned a pass on it, and it happened to be version two of that quiz. Each column represents something that I want to track, the name, the date, the objective, the results, the version, and maybe the location, whether it was in office hours or if it was a makeup or if it was in class. Then I can use the pivot tables feature, either in Excel or Google Sheets, to turn this information into a more standard looking gradebook. Uh, I then use these pivot tables to create custom progress reports in Word that I send out to students each week using a mail merge. Pivot tables have a learning curve, but I've also created video tutorial, a, a video tutorial playlist on YouTube to help you get started. The, the link for that is at the end of the slideshow. But any feedback or requests for more videos are more than welcome. Now we're on to question three. All right. So, uh, sorry. Here. Okay. Um, the of the big questions that we're covering here, uh, the most important one from the student point of view is almost certainly how am I going to get a grade, right? Like, how is my grade calculated? What do I have to do to get to get an A or or whatever? Um, and as, as has already been discussed by Kate and others, there, there's a lot to unpack in, in this kind of a question, right? <laughs> there's, there's a lot that goes into thinking about, you know, how we should assign grades. What's the best approach to doing it? Uh, in practical terms, a good way to start is to ask yourself, what would I expect from a C student? And then you can kind of extrapolate that to, you know, what would I expect from a B student? What, can I, what would I expect from an A student? Now you can answer this question in a lot of different ways and it partly depends on what were your answers to earlier questions like, you know, uh, how many learning objectives ha have you chosen? Uh, are you aiming for deep understanding of a few topics or shallower understanding of a lot of topics? You know, all these are going to affect how you, how you want to approach assigning grades. Um, and this leads to a variety of different systems that you can look at. 
uh, that range from, you know, the traditional weighted averages system, which you can still use, especially if you're going for like a very minimal mastery implementation. Um, I've seen syllabi that include, uh, you know, only part of the class is graded on mastery and the rest of the class is just very traditional. So you can do that. Uh, or you can go to uh, sort of the other end of the spectrum and use something like bundles, which is a very popular option where uh, every grade has a very, very clearly laid out list of requirements um, and students just need to check everything off the list. Um, so you've got options. You also need to consider whether you want to use plus or minus grading or whether you have to use plus or minus grading. You know, some schools require it. Um, and if you are going to use it, how do you want to fit that in? Um, and you've got options there too. And whatever system you put together, it's worth it to try and anticipate what are the problem points going to be for students and try to anticipate them, you know, try to clarify them or try to smooth them out before students run into them. So we're going to begin with uh, Justin's answers to these sorts of questions. Uh, so you can see um, this is a chart from my syllabus, uh, taking up the majority of this page here. Uh, and this identifies the bundling that I use for students to earn an A, B, C, or D in my class. Uh, Frostberg doesn't have plus minus, so I'm fortunate that I don't have to worry about that, but I'm happy to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so one of, the, one of the main ideas I use is something that I call core competency or core mastery. And that is where a student must pass some subset of learning targets that might be specified on a category basis. So for instance, in calculus, maybe they need to be able to interpret the derivative or interpret the integral, um, or maybe it's important to me that they have to interpret both, right? Maybe that category requires all of the, all of the objectives to be passed. Um, and this, uh, I see a question from Matthew. Um, this is one of the, the major driving things for me for getting into mastery grading is I, I wondered, is there a chance that my students could be passing calculus with a C without ever demonstrating the product rule correctly. And by having something like core competency and having the product rule in there, I say, yep, you are not moving on unless you've got that done. So you can see the way to read each column here is this is the minimum requirement to get that grade. So for a C, a student must have their core competency complete. The sum of their passes, pass pluses, and revisions must be at least 70%. They don't have to have any pass pluses. Uh, they have to have 70% of the learning community points. Uh, so these are like a combination of attendance and participation points. And they have to have 50% of the homework checks. And the way I grade the homework is I have one concept per assignment and there are four different points or checks. There's a point for the attempt, a point for the getting the concept right. So if I can look at your homework paper or look at this concept in question and say, yep, you've got it you get the check for concept. If you've got those first two checks, then you can get a check for attention to detail and a check for presentation. And I have a first draft of this assignment, a uh, first draft of that due quite soon, the next class meeting, and then a final draft due two weeks later. And Darcy had asked a question uh, about how much feedback do you get? And it depends, uh, how much feedback do you give? It depends a lot on what's the nature of your revision structure, right? So for they're gonna, they're gonna turn around and submit this homework again, I'm gonna circle the thing that they did wrong. I'm not gonna write out a full detailed explanation of it because I'm ex part of the learning process for them is a chance to resubmit it. So you have to think like, what are they gonna do with it? Um, and so you can see the major determiner for me uh, in moving from a B or an A, from a C to a B to an A, is really uh, how many pass pluses do they have? Uh, what's that percentage? And uh, that's because I privilege that first contact with the question. And there was another question in the, in the Q&A about how do you communicate midterm grades? I found that when I switched to this percent based uh, instead of counting how many passes, but if I switched to a percent based and grouped them together as bundles, I was able to communicate midterm grades a little bit better. Otherwise, um, you know, you kind of in, enter the situation where maybe at midterm, everybody has an F because no bundles are complete, right? There's no chance. If you stopped here, you wouldn't pass, and that kind of freaks them out. Uh, so you have to, midterm grades are a tricky subject. Um, Emily, do you want to talk about how you uh, translate this into a letter grade? Yeah, so I do something uh, similar to what Justin mentioned, um, and, and definitely it's a, a bundle situation. So 
some minimum numbers, number of standards passed. Um, people were asking about, you know, are all, do all standards carry the same weight? Um, and I've done two types of things, um, sometimes having core and supplementary standards and sometimes having, you know, all standards are, are pretty much the same and you have to pass some subset of them. Um, so that's one component, uh, the learning community percentage. So, you know, these, this includes a lot of things like participation, um, sometimes like daily homework assignments, um, things like that, um, online exercises. Uh, so some, you know, minimal percentage that they need to get, usually I do 70% for C, 80% for B, 90% for an A, um, and then some minimum number of this other stuff. So either projects or portfolio, application problems. Um, so those are the main kind of three categories in my grading. Um, plus, if it's a class where I have the final exam, then that grade modifier final exam would be factored in. Um, I do use plus minus grades and I actually find that these are nice because I can reward students for kind of going beyond a category and but just not quite making it to the next category. So for instance, if I have a student that did everything for a B and they were trying really hard and they did you know, some other stuff, but they didn't quite get the A, um, then I give a plus minus, so either a B plus or an A minus, kind of at my discretion. Um, so it's usually tied to, you know, just, I have very small classes, so I know all my students. So it's my perceptions of, you know, how hard the student worked in the class and maybe how close they were to the next category, right? If they were really close to an A, then maybe the A minus over the B plus. Um, so yeah, I know other people do other things with plus or minus, like that's where they would use the learning community percentage. And to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of gonna try that next semester because I just have a lot of students that don't do the online homework and I'm sick of trying to remind them. So um, I think I might change to more of a um, where the plus or minus comes from actually like the learning community percentage. Um, Tom, can we hear about your class? One of the reasons that I switched over to mastery grading was specifically for simplicity. I don't like agony, agonizing over the number of partial credit points to award or students asking, how many points do I need on the final to pass the course? So in the systems that I use, I prioritize simplicity, both how a particular assignment is graded and how students can determine their letter grades. The chart below captures the kind of simplicity that I'm going for. The chart accompanies each weekly progress report that I send to students so that they can easily look above to see what their progress is with respect to the chart that's below. If I have 25 skill-based objectives and each can be passed twice for 50, I call them check marks, I usually build in a few other ways that they can earn check marks such as homework, labs, attendance. And in the case of the chart below, there was a maximum of 58 possible check marks. After starting with cutoffs at the 90%, 80%, et cetera levels, I consider what I think passing should be and then massage the letter grade thresholds a bit to match. Bundles are common, but so far I've avoided them because in skill base, I've avoided them in my skill-based courses. Uh, I end up, you know, again, stressing over situations where a student overachieves in one area, but underachieves in another. Uh, for a skill-based course, uh, if they've mastered every single skill, I believe that student deserves an A regardless of their progress in, say, online homework. So I tend to use other graded components like homework as a buffer uh, to not require mastering every single objective twice. Certainly with the move to online, the desire to have even more uh, flexibility in how students can demonstrate this mastery towards achieving letter grade. Chad? All right, uh, so for my proof classes, I, I also use bundles, um, like some of the earlier speakers. Uh, I've got an example here from, I believe this is from a topology course. Um, like I've said earlier, I don't have really long lists of specific learning objectives in these sorts of courses, so I don't generally have a very wide variety of requirements. The main focus of the course is proofs, that's what students spend most of their time on. But I've added a few other requirements to fill particular niches that I view as important for the class. So for example, um, the learning objective requirement that you see listed here is there to make sure that students don't somehow end up skipping major topics of the course. 
you know, a, as an example, should you be able to pass a topology course if you can't write a good proof about homeomorphisms? Right? That, that's, that's the situation that I was kind of worried about. Um, so I added this requirement. Uh, in this example on the screen, uh, pass means you passed one proof from that content area and master means you passed two of them. Um, the requirement is not onerous. It, it rarely makes a, a difference um, in someone's grade. It's just there to avoid a bad situation that I was worried about. So I, I built it into the system to account for it. Uh, the graded discussions are there to encourage community building in an online setting, which I mentioned earlier, I, I think that's important. Uh, so I add that there. That's also not very onerous. Um, it's largely built on participation. Um, and the presentation is there as a sort of capstone to demonstrate deeper knowledge and creativity. And it's something that I would expect from higher achieving students, uh, students who are going for higher grades, and so I only require it for, uh, for higher grades. Um, like Tom, I think that simplicity in a grading system is really important. Uh, I want students to feel like they have agency in the grade that, that they get. Um, and I, I think that they ought to know exactly what's required of them to get the grade that they want. Uh, so this system is simple enough that there generally aren't any, any twists or pitfalls that I need to worry about. But I am willing to make adjustments on the fly if needed. Um, to pick an example out of thin air, if there's a sudden pandemic that <laughs> it means we have to change how we're, we're organizing the entire semester, I will make adjustments to the grading system uh, on the fly. And it's always in the student's favor. Uh, I don't want to suddenly make things harder on them. But if I feel like circumstances require some tweaking, I'm, I'm open to doing that. Okay, uh, now we will move on to our final big question. Yeah, so how this question, this last one, how do I add flexibility for students and myself? If reading the Q&A and uh, my own experience is any, any indication, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about how much reassessment am I doing exactly? And uh, that's important for the students. How do I stay sane, right? What am I gonna do uh, to, to manage that? How often are reassessments allowed? We all have different takes on that. Uh, and another way of adding flexibility uh, is a token economy. So a token is an in-class currency that students can accumulate that allows them to break the rules in some way. Um, and so I'll talk about that uh, when it comes to, to my end. Um, but this is, a, this is one not to lose sight on um, because you can quickly get yourself bogged down in something unsustainable. Um, if you've lost sight of this, but I will say that I think all of us are pretty happy with the sustainability of our mastery grading, right? There's a reason we're talking about it today. So it's quite possible, um, but uh, you just have to keep this one in mind. So Emily? Yeah, so um, I, again, small classes, I allow regular reassessments. Um, Someone asked earlier about, you know, how do you make sure the students stay on schedule? And so I limit the number of reassessments they can do per week, uh, which in theory will, will help them stay on that schedule. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of depends on you and your class. Um, but I, I do these reassessments usually in office hours. Um, when we've transitioned to online, I've taken to um, if it's you know a class where I have sort of paper-based assessments, I'll just send it to them at a particular time. I've been making use of Gmail's schedule send feature. So if they want, if I if they say I want to take it tomorrow at one, then I will schedule it to send it to them tomorrow at one. Um, and that's been sort of nice for the reassessment for online. I've also used my math lab for some courses, and you can sort of build in reassessments in there as well. So if in the online environment, it might be nice to use some of these technology features to help you with the reassessment. Um, I also, you know, if it's a proof writing course, then they can revise proofs on homework by just turning in a revision. I also try to, to put a maximum on that. And that was, I kind of um, got rid of all my maximums when the pandemic hit because I just wanted them to, you know, focus on themselves and, and turn in things and I had a lot to grade at the end. So definitely recommend putting in some sort of limits um, for your own sanity. Um, and just want to talk about tokens. I have used tokens in the past, um, but really lately I've had fewer and fewer strict due dates. Um, so there's usually things that are built into the due dates. Um, for instance, on the online work, there's 
automatic late passes that they can get. So using things like that has really diminished my need, at least for the use of tokens. Um, but we will talk a little bit about how you can use some tokens um, in this session. Uh, Tom? All right. Each week, students are allowed to reattempt one quiz over any objective. Reattempting work is a core philosophical value in my teaching, and I want to encourage it by making it as easy for students as possible. In some cases, students can earn the ability to take a second quiz. For example, a student, if the student passes the first quiz, then they can take a second one in a week. In our Calc 1 and 2 courses, we have gateway exams where all objectives relating to computing a derivative or computing an, an antiderivative, an integral, those are always assessed together. So students have to pass nine out of 10 derivatives to pass the derivative gateway. And that can be reattempted weekly. So you can bundle some of them together. If students pass a major milestone like the gateway exam, we say, that, or I say that they level up and then they can take two reattempts per week for the rest of the semester. The thought is that before passing the gateway, students should be making that a priority rather than a second weekly quiz reattempt. These reattempts can be taken any time that I'm in my office, and I found that formal scheduling created more overhead than it was worth. I have a large problem bank and can fairly quickly make a new quiz version just on demand. Uh, because I change all graded components into check marks, students have some flexibility with how they can improve their grade. They can master a specific objective. Uh, sorry, it's mastering specific objectives might be required, but students who struggle with the pressure of quizzes can choose to instead focus their efforts on doing more online homework or completing a lab project. So they can use these check marks to kind of fill in some holes. Us, other students may find it less time intensive to just focus really intently on studying for a single objective and trying to pass it that way than doing a large amount of diverse homework or you know writing up an entire lab project. Chad? All right uh, so my eternal battle in teaching in all my classes is trying to balance giving students opportunities with keeping on top of my workload. So um, I mentioned earlier that, especially in proof classes, I feel like revisions are really critical to the process, you know, modeling this sort of professional mathematical structure. Um, so I, I will allow students to revise basically everything, um, but I, I limit the amount of revisions that they can do. I generally re limit them to two revised problems per week because I'm kind of a slow grader. And if I get behind on my grading, things start to snowball out of control and it goes badly for the class. Um, but I will try to add in um, corrections for this as much as I can. Like for instance, at the end of the semester, students will typically get extra revision chances if they need an opportunity to catch up. Um, so they get that a little bit. Uh, I try to keep my deadlines as flexible as possible. Uh, so it, this is an example of some, uh, a way that I feel like I've managed to turn a weakness into something of a, of a strength. Uh, so my rule of thumb is that if a student submits something before I'm done grading the assignment, I will, I will just add it to the pile and I will grade it. And because I tend to be a slow grader, especially with proofs, this gives students a sort of automatic buffer that they tend to appreciate. Uh, and especially considering uh, in my online courses at, at ESU, our online courses are typically graduate courses. So uh, my students are typically have families and careers and it's not uncommon at all for sudden life events to interfere with getting homework done. And so they know that they've got this little extra built in, uh, built in time if they need it. Um, so it, it kind of eases off the stress, which is always something good. Um, so yeah, I'm willing to extend deadlines as necessary. I don't want to eliminate them completely because I'm trying to avoid the avalanche of grading at the end of the semester problem. Um, but I'll, I'll do, I'll extend deadlines. I'll add extra revisions if necessary. Basically the strategy is to give students as many chances as possible to show me that they can, they can meet the bar that I've set, uh, and give them as much flexibility as I can without falling behind and creating a bad experience for everybody. All right, Justin. Yeah, so on the topic of deadlines, I think one of the questions that I find myself asking is, uh, what am I grading, right? So when it, when it comes to a deadline, I think, okay, does, do I care that it's on time as long as the student demonstrates the knowledge, 
right? Because that's kind of where the mastery grading is about. Um, so for me, right, uh, my answer to the question about reassessments, I generally don't have them because I've, I've found that for the kinds of questions that I write, uh, a conceptual question becomes procedural upon reassessment. And so it's taken me a long time to get here, but I've actually, I kind of walk away from reassessments. But learning from the mistake is super important. That's why you see in my bundles, uh, one of the grade categories is the percentage of pass, pass plus, and revisions, right? To get an A or a B or a C, you still have to do a high number of revisions. Um, but I just, I found that I can't count them quite the same as a pass. Uh, but this in particular keeps my grading load down. But you got to balance everything kind of around that decision. Um, I, for myself, as I, I think I answered in the, the q and I tend to say, how much grading per week am I, am I allowed to give this class? And I designed a system around that to make sure that that's sustainable. Um, so in terms of tokens, uh, as we answered in the chat, tokens are a in-class currency. Uh, in my classes, everybody starts with one token. They can earn up to three additional tokens throughout the term. Uh, so that might be, hey, we've got a speaker on campus this week. If you go to that talk, or if you can't go to the talk, uh, show me that you watched a YouTube video related to that talk, um, you earn a token. And these tokens can be exchanged uh, for learning community points, homework points, but almost all of my students use them to convert not yet grades into pass pluses or passes into pass pluses. And they do that by recording a video solution uh, for uh, the particular quiz that they're interested in. And I found that by watching that video solution, I have a really clear idea about whether the student uh, knows that topic or not, right? Especially if they're speaking extemporaneously, um, it's, it's a very clear indication. And uh, Robert Talbert and his colleagues have a good paper, um, Video Made the Calculus Star, I think. Uh, and it's got good guidelines on how to have uh, videos. And next semester, I'm gonna allow tokens to also change the grade modifier thresholds on the final exam. And so I find tokens just to be a good way to encourage extracurricular behavior um, that I wouldn't wanna give extra credit to by itself because I, I believe that any credit in the class should be about demonstrating knowledge but the tokens then unlock the opportunity to earn that extra credit. And uh, James Hallis in the Q&A asked uh, about bundles and uh, what happens if a student has A's in most categories, but maybe a D in one category. Uh, what do you do about that? And, you know, it's at the end of the semester and you have to ask yourself that question, do I still believe that these are the exact right waiting. Sometimes you decide, you know what, I thought that was the right thing and it's really not. Um, sometimes you say, you know what, they demonstrated a high level of learning um, and I don't care about that online homework as much. Or sometimes you might say, you know what, no, actually every one of the, you know, those homework questions were really important to me and I'm going to stick to it. Um, but the point is to give yourself some freedom to adjust the percentages or adjust the bundles based on your experience in the class. So I almost always adjust uh, one category or another in a, as a, by a couple percentage to say, you know what, that one quiz was really hard. <laughs> and so there's just no, not enough people got that reach question. Uh, they misunderstood it. I'm going to walk that percent, that category back a couple percent, just like you might do by saying, you know what, I'm going to throw out that exam question right? Or I'm going to change the weights on, the, on a, a traditional exam. Uh, I change the weights on my bundles uh, quite frequently. Or sometimes I give a student an incomplete and say, you know what, you're going to get, you've got this grade, do the homework so that you can earn another grade. You can use it to cheerlead them up to another grade. So I think uh, that's it. Our next uh, next topic up is the, well, that didn't work, right? Uh, potholes. So uh, start with Emily. What did you, what have you run into? Yeah, this is a good segue from what you were just talking about. Um, a, a lot of people have been asking, like, you know, how do I set the, the different grade thresholds and how do I set the standards? Um, and again, that's really up to you and what you value and what you want students to do in your class. But I have noticed for myself, um, in the past, I 
you know, I wanted them to learn everything, right? We want ev everyone to learn everything. That's the point of our classes. And I found that I made kind of too many standards um, and required too high of thresholds. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, at least for me, I've had to kind of reassess every semester, just like Justin was talking about. I think at this point, I have, you know, some classes I've done this and it's pretty good. Um, but I think, you know, don't be afraid to readjust. I have readjust mid semester before saying like, okay, now you only need, you know, 25 standards instead of 30 for an A or something like that. Students never are upset if you are going down. Um, they, in fact, are really excited about that. So if you're saying, you know, actually this was too ambitious, I need to kind of walk it back. Um, students, I think, are appreciative of that. They also understand or tend to understand that, you know, that you're doing this for them um, and you want, you know, them to kind of complete this work and, and pass these standards. And so um, you kind of have to kind of bring them along with you. So I, I would just kind of think about what are the standards that are really crucial, really essential that you would want, let's say, your C student to know when they pass your class, right? And maybe go on to the next class and kind of use that a, as, a, as a starting point. But I'll also add to that, you know, don't be afraid to readjust. Um, that, is, that is a part of this in my experience. Tom? Some of my pitfalls, the main one was the first time I used mastery grading, I used a zero, one, two tier system. So on a particular quiz, they would get a score of zero, one or two and two meant perfect uh, and one meant small errors and zero meant more major errors. But the problem was if I had two problems on a particular quiz and they got one of them right, that they think, she, they think that they should get one out of two points when the issue there is one did not mean half right. So. Uh, that wound up causing a lot of issues and I moved away from even a, any kind of point-based system that I was trying to use to communicate mastery. Uh, the other thing that has been a constant evolution is how I track grades. And as I mentioned before, I've kind of settled on pivot tables, but before then were a whole mess of different methods that involved uh, greater uh, entry error rates and poor setups of communicating progress that I've since uh, gotten away from. All right, so uh, my biggest failures have all involved uh, making things too complicated. So um, for example, my first attempt at uh, mastery grading was uh, a specifications grading system. It was an abstract algebra course. And I decided to try sorting all the problems into easy, medium, and hard and build that into the system. I have to pass a certain number of easy problems, et cetera. Uh, and I failed miserably at this. Uh, like it wasn't necessary to do that in the first place and I sorted them poorly. So students just had a miserable time with that. Um, and then more recently, just to show you, this isn't like a beginner problem. Like you constantly have to revise how you're, how you're doing things. Um, fairly recently, I taught a calc class um, and I tried to do something a little more like what Tom does with the check marks. I uh, wanted to add some flexibility into my bundles by letting homework and lab assignments count toward uh, passes for standards um, as like bonus passes, but I didn't do it in as elegant a way as Tom does with the check marks. So uh, basically students could not keep track of how much they had actually passed because you could put bonus passes in different places and I couldn't even keep track of how much they had passed. And so no one knew what their grade was it, and it was a bad time. So uh, like the biggest lesson I've had is just, just keep things simple. Um, it just, it, it, you know, if you don't, it kills the feeling of agency that students have. They revert to feeling like grades are just something that happens to them and they don't really have a lot of control over it. Um, and it just, it kills the mood for the whole course. Yeah, I think that that's um, spot on in terms of complicated systems. Uh, every, uh, besides the, the thing I have here about conceptual questions becoming procedural, um, the majority of my missteps have been from complicated systems. Uh, and there's a question in the Q&A about maintaining mastery. Um, and the most complicated system I ever came up with involved um, 
trying to, to address that maintaining mastery question where a student demonstrates mastery early on and then they reveal on a later uh, assessment that maybe that mastery is not quite up to speed. And that was so confusing for everybody involved. Um, I, so keeping it simple. Um, but in terms of specifically addressing that question, I know Kate um, has some good thoughts on it. Um, for me personally, I've, I've come to peace with thinking about mastery, not as what they can produce on the spot when the math mugger meets them in a dark alley, right? But what they could, you know, what's really in there if they took the time to really talk about it, right? Uh, and so a quiz maybe isn't the best way to, to bring that forward, uh, especially on a second, you know, on a, on a reassessment. That might not mean uh, the same thing that I think it means. Um, but another, uh, another one that's not on here, uh, but it came up at the, the Mastery Grading Workshop, is uh, be very careful if you're going to call anything in your course points, um, right? We, we use labels like not yet, pass, <laughs> revised, right? Uh, if you, and, and you can put it into Canvas or your LMS as like a three out of four corresponds to a pass plus, um, but the student will see that three out of four as a 75% and they will get confused. Uh, and anything that that smacks of traditional grading is going to is going to be confusing. Yeah. So we've got uh, links here um, that you can read, and we've got some time, uh, I believe, for questions. I'm not sure exactly what the format for that is. Sharona, do you want to field questions for us? Okay. Yeah, I can field questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow people to raise their hands um, and call on them. And if you'd like to ask it vocally, or you can also still um, drop it. I think we can actually, the host is going to be the one that has to allow people to talk. So MAA host, are you available to let people talk? I don't have. Yes, sure. And no, we can absolutely do that. No okay. problem. Great. So we have a, not overwhelming for y'all. Yes. So we have Faraz Musvi who has his hand up if we can let him talk or her. I apologize. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry, I think that was a mistake. Like, my question has been answered already. Okay, so just go ahead and lower your hand. No problem. Yeah. So if anyone else wants to either raise their hand to ask a verbal um, or put additional things in the Q&A, um, we do have a question, if any of our panelists want to get to it, any of us have experience using master grading in both math degree programs and general studies courses? Um, do all students in the course have the same standards for mastery? Anyone want to take that one on? Sure, I'll, I'll, not, I'll, yeah, I'll sure, take that one. First. Um, I've used mastery grading in courses designed specifically for math majors. I have taught some classes for, we have a weird vector calculus class that's just for our chemistry majors. Um, I definitely teach a lot of general education courses. My approach is that uh, I sort of look at what the, the course is designed to do. Like, what do I think the central big questions are that this course is supposed to answer? And students demonstrating that they can give those answers to those big questions is what's important to me. And it doesn't matter to me specifically who the student is or what their background is or what kind of class it is. Try and figure out what, what questions is this course trying to answer and in what ways can I help students to produce those answers. And it's the same for every student that's in a particular classroom for me. Okay. And in, in my class, in, in my case, uh, our business school one time complained that our students our students taking intro stats uh, could not use a z-score table and I was able to say look here you know here are the assessments that I have that line up with that standard and they agreed that if they could do those questions that they were in good shape and so they, they quickly yielded that maybe there's some attrition you know in the three semesters from when they took stats to when they used it in business. Okay we have Margaret Robinson did you have a question for us? I see that you are marked as talking permitted. No. Okay, how about Aradi uh, Pati? I apologize. Do you have a question for us? 
You have to unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, there you are. So how you handle the difficult students who, do, who don't understand this? And uh, how do you deal with the bias or ethics with this? I could talk a little bit about this. Um, I mentioned this in one of the earlier Q&A answers that I will spend more time prepping for my sales pitch for the first day of class than I will for any amount of content in that first week of class that you really have to think, okay, how am I going to sell this to students? There's a good video from Sal Khan of Khan Academy. He has a YouTube video of him selling this, and I usually play that at the start of course. The other thing that's important is repetition, repetition, repetition. Uh, coming back, like try to figure out something tiny that you can assess very early on in the course. So in college algebra, I will give it a standard just over, can I add, subtract, multiply, and divide fractions and decimals? So be very quick that I could give on like the third day of class so that they can have their first attempt and I can show them, okay, this is exactly how your grade changed. And then I revisit it, you know, a week later and probably about the two week mark, about the drop deadline, I'll go through and say, is there anybody who hasn't tried to reassess anything? And then I'll reach out to them individually. It's a lot of effort in those first two weeks to make sure that no one's getting left behind. But if you get the whole class kind of in the, in the swing of things in those first two weeks, then it kind of just runs itself. Yeah, I'll second that. I, time and again, just come back. Like if I give them their first quizzes back, I'll be like, okay, let's get out our you know, quiz tracker and where do we put this? Um, and, and you just kind of have to mention something about it almost every day. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you have the same students that you've already had before and they uh, will then explain it to the other students. I've had that happen, which is awesome. Um, but it is gonna be different and you just have to keep coming back to it. And I, I find, find that, that it's the A students who have the hardest time trying to understand this, the, um, the ones who are used to getting every point ever made. And I just, a lot of times we'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them that says, look, you just need to relax a little bit. You're doing great. We've only had one assessment. You got mastery on everything. And yes, it doesn't show because you have to do it twice, but we haven't done twice yet. So it does take uh, a little bit of handholding. Um, those are the ones you have the biggest issue with. The, the C students, the ones who are used to getting 70% and just skating by, um, most of them do so much better under this grading scheme that they have no issues once they figure it out. Yeah. Um, I find it really helpful to have uh, a first assignment that's like, here are the, the different assessment results for a, a fictional student and take the syllabus and, and calculate the grade based on that. Um, in terms of buy-in, I find it really helpful to, to talk up the fact that, oh yeah, you fell down on this, but guess what? You've got another shot, right? That's why, um, that's why this matters. And one of my one of my major success stories is from a student who failed my intro to stats class um, and had failed it in the past before. Um, and I switched to this mastery grading thing and she was just aiming for a C because that was what she needed to pass. And I said, you know what, like, that's good, right? Focus on that. But why don't you spend a little bit of energy trying to work yourself to a higher grade and she got the highest grade that she's ever gotten in a math class um, as a result of just being able to be relieved that her failures weren't holding her back. Okay. There was, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to tee up the next one's going to be. There okay. was, uh, if I heard right, there was a bit at the end of that question about, uh, about bias and ethics. And I know a few questions came through the, the Q and A about that. So I, I wanted to just touch on that really briefly. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, um, like, I, I don't think you can get away from having some subjectivity in, in your grades. Um, but I think that uh, master grading probably handles it better. Uh, it feels like everything's just like an arbitrary judgment call at first. And, but I think that's partly because the fact that we're used to using points gives this sort of illusion of objectivity that isn't necessarily mm -hmm. there. Um, Instead, you know, having having requirements very clearly laid out and having clear standards about what counts as a pass and what doesn't, and giving extensive feedback when students don't uh, don't make it, I think 
takes away a lot of the arbitrary feeling that students have uh, regarding grades. So while I don't think it's completely objective, I think it's better than the previous system. Robert likes to say it's subjective with transparency. Robert Talbert. <laughs> okay, we have Francesca Gandini, if we could allow her to talk. And I apologize since we don't have preferred pronouns, I'm just going by names. Francesca, if you wanna. Uh, yeah. There we go. So I was wondering if any of you have experience with auto reassessment. So I've been trying reassessment in my quizzes and sometimes a conversation with the students goes great and then they redo it and it's still like quite not there for some stupid reason. And I kind of would like to use the oral, like I have the power to say you just reassessed, you got it passed and you don't need to redo it in, on paper yet. Any experience with that? Anyone here using oral reassessment? Uh, I have not, but I've heard I've heard a lot of people talk about it, you know, on Twitter and and in in master grading circles. So, if uh, if nobody here has experience with it, you should definitely uh, ask on the Slack channel uh, because I'll bet there are people who have done it and could give you some pointers. I believe T.J. Hitchman does oral reassessment in his Intro to Proofs course or something, but definitely. There's, you know, the point is we're looking for evidence of mastery. Do we really care if they have to be able to write it? Well, it, and this actually goes to one of the Q and A's. If you care about them being able to write it, then writing should be a separate objective because there's understanding the content and then there's being able to write it. And those are actually two different things. So I have about seven to 10 mathematical process standards in my course that have to do with communicating a viable argument, using precision, looking for structure. Uh, someone asked about technology. I actually have a technology standard that says you can use technology, whether it's a calculator or other things. So if you feel that they need to be able to do something in a specific modality, then that should be its own standard because otherwise you're conflating the modality with the, co with the content. Um, I think we have a, maybe three or four more minutes. We have a few things in the Q&A. Um, trouble explaining the grading scheme to a dean or a department after the student raises concerns or challenges. I've actually had the opposite experience. Um, you know, they, they go to the chair and the chair comes to me and I say, here's the 12 things they're supposed to know. They knew four. And the chair goes, oh, okay, good enough. Uh, anyone else have that experience? I've found it easy to I don't know, pitch this to others. In fact, um, you know, I've had people come observe my class for peer evaluations and every single time they're like, can I see your syllabus? What is this thing what, that you're doing? Um, so I don't know, I've never had any issues with explaining this to, to chairs, deans, etc. cetera. Um, explaining it to students, I think is, is the hardest part. Okay, we also have a question in the chat about using online homework systems as a component. Again, I'll share mine. Um, I do have one standard that I call my PPP. Uh, it's a preparation, participation, and practice standard. I call it its habits of mind. It's the only thing in my course that is points graded and it's graded on an accumulation basis. So they have to get up to a certain number of points like eight or 900 out of 12 or 1300 available. Um, and that's where I use my online homework systems and that's where all of my online discussions go. Basically, there's many, many paths to accumulating these points and it's just basically proved that you've learned to do the work you need to do to learn the math. And it's one standard out of anywhere from 15 to 25 standards uh, and they all lump in there. Is there anyone else that wants to share their use of online homeworks? Online homework systems? So uh, similar to what you had, uh, where I have like in the calculus course or college algebra course and I have say 25 standards and I want students to pass each of them twice. Uh, online homework for me is something I assign for, I've done it two different ways. So for college algebra, I assigned all the homework for the whole semester. And if they just got 90% of it, I would just kind of give them four check marks that they could kind of put wherever they wanted. Uh, but more recently in calculus, what I did was I created a small homework assignment for each, for each standard. And if they didn't pass the standard in class, if they wanted to read something in office hours, they had to complete the online homework associated with that standard just to show that, hey, they practiced it a little bit. And other than that, I did not have it as a graded component. 
We have a question in the Q&A. Face-to-face, it sounds like drop in my office and take a quiz. Works really well. What do you all do online? I want to share that one. Well. So uh, when we did the, the sudden pivot to online teaching in the spring, um, that was the first time I'd really taught these like skill-based courses online in for proof-based courses. It's not really an issue because I'm not, I'm not using quizzes in the same way. Um, but for, for like my linear algebra class, uh, I, I just sent out copies of the, of the quiz um, through canvas and had students like photo their photograph, their solutions, like write them out and photograph them and send them back to me. And I graded in that way. And I was a little concerned about, you know, this, there's not a lot of security here, but under the circumstances, I wasn't going to worry about it too much. And I didn't notice any any egregious problems with uh, with academic honesty or anything like that. So um, I'm thinking about whether I want to try and improve that somehow for this fall. But uh, the using that system works just fine for the spring. Well, and for me, I use Canvas quizzes. Um, in my calculus class, similar to Chad, it's here's some problems, do the work, take a picture and upload it to the quiz, because then I do at least have the FERPA security on their work. Um, more important than how I'm doing it, though, is the types of questions. So I use a lot of open middle questions and, and choose your own, like, hey, I want you to you know, create a function that does this, this, and this. Like when I did parametric equations, I was like, here's a couple of equations, pick a point, and then, and then calculate this stuff. And it became very obvious when they picked a point that um, someone else had helped them versus when they did it themselves. Uh, I had minimal, I did have some cheating, but it was minimal. I had like four or five students out of 400 in statistics who went to Chegg. And again, most of the time we can catch it. One of the great things about Chegg is um, it's very, very sensitive to search terms. So if you um, reword your questions, even if it's the exact same questions, but you change the start wording, Chegg won't find it on its own database, even if it's the same problem. So we've taken to doing that. We also, ver I version, uh, so I'll do three or four versions of every question in the quiz. And so every student is getting a unique combination of questions. And that can be done, again, it doesn't have to be done algorithmically. It can be done very um, organically and they can do an essay up, um, answer upload or they can again take a picture and upload. So you tend to catch the cheaters when they give you answers that don't match their version. So simple things you can do, 95% of the students didn't. Um, and again, because part of it is why do it when you've already invested so much time and energy. And, um, and we are pursuing, you know, we're going to pursue academic misconduct against those who did just to kind of keep a lid on it. Um, and I do check. I mean, as soon as, as soon as I put a quiz out, I go on Chag and if it shows up, well, usually it's the one version and I have a limited number of students who've already taken that version and I can do a little investigating. Uh, the other thing that I do is I tell them that I'm always reserving the right to call them to explain their answers. So they know that they ha that they might, if I think there's something funky or not, if I just want them to show me more mastery, we might set up an office hours call for them to explain what they did. And that's just a little psychological thing there. Mm -hmm. The other uh, move that I took from the MA webinar on uh, online assessment was to ask a question like, hey, I found this answer on Chegg. Can you explain what, can you explain it or give me a different solution? And when you're grading more holistically, you're not worried about assigning points to all the different ways that they might attempt to explain it. So you're looking at it holistically and saying, yeah, they've got it, right? I can call that a pass. Um, exactly. And the other thing is we talk a lot about Chegg. Um, also very dangerous for us is photo math. So we really have to rethink what we're assessing because if you want to know if they can do a derivative, asking them what the derivative of a function that's algebraically defined is, literally PhotoMath lets you take a picture of the problem and it will actually do the calculation for you. So we really need to start doing more types of assessing like, hey, make a function and then take its derivative. And then when your function shows up, you know, among seven of your students, I'm going to ask you what caused you to create that function. So again, there's some better ways, but that's all a whole assessment thing. We can talk mm -hmm. about that for hours. Do we have any more questions? Um, 
For the MAA host, we have a question in the Q&A. Are the Q&As and the chat going to be made available with the video? Um, I don't know if they can answer that. Do we have either Kira or Grace who might be able to let us know if we could tell people that one? Okay, we'll try and get that answer. I don't know. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We want to definitely thank the MAA for putting this on um, and Justin and Tom and Chad and Emily and Kate who had to take off. The editors of the Prima Special Issue um, have been doing Herculean work for two years. Um, Masterygrading.com, please go. Like we said, there's 16 hours of video plus everyone's contact information. Join us on the Slack. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, my mute was acting a little wonky. Yes, we'll be able to have that Q&A ready for you all. Thank you. Perfect.